Hello, and welcome to the second installment of our Pipe Vision series. Our theme tonight is music and mythology. The first work on this evening's program will likely be unknown to both organists and non-organists. It's a work that's captivated me for years since I first heard it, and I'm delighted to finally have a chance to play it. However, to better understand and enjoy it, I think it's important to know a bit more about it. Let's start with the title, Hamadryas Compeni. The first part, Hamadryas, refers to a Hamadryad, a certain type of nymph that, according to Greek and Roman mythology, lives and dies within trees. Compeni is no doubt a reference to Esaias Compenius, a German organ builder who lived in the 16th and 17th centuries. This piece was written by Axel Andersen, a Danish organist who lived in the early 20th century, and it was written specifically for the Compenius organ. Now, this organ was built in 1610 and currently resides in Frederiksborg Castle in Denmark. So we have a unique blend of ancient and modern, with a 20th century composer writing music for an instrument built in the 17th century. The Compenius organ is one of the oldest, unaltered, and still fully functioning organs in the world. It has 1,001 pipes that are enclosed in a beautifully carved wooden case. Among these carvings can be found the hamadryads that served as the inspiration to Anderson in addition to the forest of wooden pipes that make up the organ. For those of you who may never have seen the inside of an organ, I'm currently sitting in the forest of pipes that resides inside the St. Luke's organ, though ours is a mixture of wooden and metal pipes. The Compenius organ is interesting in that it was never built for use as a church instrument. Instead, it was built for dance and entertainment purposes. Because of this, it has a unique variety of sounds, different than what might be found on a typical organ today. While it's difficult to achieve the same sounds that Anderson had in mind while writing this piece for the Compenius organ, I've done my best to replicate that on our organ here at St. Luke's. This also allows us to hear some very unique colors from our instrument that would likely never be heard in a worship service and even in most concerts. The piece itself appears to outline the life of a hamadryad. It opens with an ambiguous tone cluster representative of the cosmos and the motionless infinity of time and space. Then a melody that I believe represents the spirit of the Hamadryad appears. The melody is transformed as the work goes on, depicting the nymph at play. The work eventually concludes in a similar way to how it began. The now familiar melody takes on a more sorrowful tone as the Hamadryad nears the end of its life. In the final moments of the piece, we hear a single melody line, almost as if the Hamadryad is now crying out as death takes over. The tone cluster we heard at the opening of the piece returns, and along with the melody moves further and further up into the organ's highest registers, as if depicting the spirit of the Hamadryad departing this world before fading away into nothing.
The composer of our next piece, David Shalott, writes this about his work. Cocopelli was a fertility god, usually shown in extant artworks as a humpbacked woodwind player, often with feathers or other protrusions coming from his head. He was worshipped by some Native American cultures in the southwestern United States. Like most fertility gods, Cocopelli symbolically officiated over both childbirth and agriculture. He is also known as a trickster god and represents the spirit of music, which is why I chose him as the subject of this piece. The piece is in three sections. The first section is light and whimsical. After the opening, you hear a jaunty melody played on a reed sound in the left hand. This leads into a second, more lyrical, quiet section that shows off some of the strings and flutes of the organ. The piece then transitions back to similar material as the opening. However, David and Cocapelli play a trick on both the organist and the listener. The melody that we heard in the first section now sounds slightly different because it has an extra beat added in each measure. So my challenge to you is to see if you can figure out how to tap your foot along with it the second time around.
The last piece on this evening's program, Circe by Carson Kuhlman, is written for soprano, solo, and organ. The soprano part will be sung by my wife, Grace, who is also on staff here at St. Luke's as the Associate Director of Music and Fine Arts. I've asked her to tell you more about this dramatic piece. This work sets the story of Circe, the sorceress from Homer's Odyssey. However, in the spirit of contemporary adaptation, the texts are three poems by American poet Louise Gluck from her book Meadowlands. In the Odyssey, Odysseus and his men, returning home from the Trojan War, are lured to Circe's island. Through her magic, Circe transforms Odysseus's men into animals, but with help from the god Hermes, Odysseus is able to resist her magic himself, and Circe is forced to restore his men to human form. For the next year, Odysseus and his men remain on the island in leisure, and Odysseus becomes Circe's lover. However, after the year has passed, Odysseus decides to continue the journey home to Ithaca, to return to his wife, Penelope, who is patiently waiting for him. Circe reluctantly lets him go. Despite her divine heritage, the Circe of Gluck's poems is consumed with the quite human emotions of longing, bitterness, and jealousy.
Well. 